Thank you for tuning in to this week's message. For more information about Connections Church, you can go to connectionschurch.church or follow us on Facebook and Instagram. That's not great news when we throw it all out like that. But what we do know is that God is still on the throne and He is still our peace in the midst of a storm and that He can bring the love and the grace that He needs to these families. And so we're going to remember them as we pray this morning. We want to remember Roberta and her family. Her, both of her daughters are uh, uh, sick with different things. Donna is under the treatment of a, of a liver team and, and Robbie has an infection in her foot and can't go to work. And so we want to pray for them this morning and their healing. Kaylee, uh, my daughter-in-law, has been sick again uh, this week and is doing a little bit better, but we want to continue to pray for her. And then uh, Evan, we mentioned this morning in our prayer time. Um, is it okay if I... Uh, Evan is um, undergoing some chemo treatments uh, for some cancer that has reappeared. And so uh, I would love it if, if you'd stand with him, somebody this morning, uh, Pastor Joseph, anybody who wishes to. I believe, and when I say I believe, I hesitate to even say that because we say that so much in church. But I believe God can. And I believe God will. Does anybody else in the house believe that? I don't believe that he told us to pray about these things and pray over these things and he wasn't going to do something about it. I believe God can. And more than that, I believe God will. And so I just can't wait to get to it. Will you join me this morning? Heavenly Father. Oh. God, I don't even have the words this morning to express what you've done for us. You brought us here in freedom this morning. We, we stand and we worship you. What kind of love does the Father have on us that he would even be mindful of us this morning? So we worshiped you and we praise you and we raise our hands to you to glorify who you are. I didn't come here this morning to get anything from you, God. I came to give everything that I am to you. I came to worship. I came to glorify. I came to praise. I came to see what you do. And you showed up here already in such a big way. And now this morning, God, we, we call on these needs. Oh, the the pain and the heaviness and the burden that is, is on the, the families who have lost loved ones this week. Why, God? They sometimes ask. But as I was reminded by a dear brother this morning, it's our job to just trust. We don't know the answers. We can't say the right words to soothe and to, and to help. This morning, we trust. We trust in you. We trust that you are the God that you say you are. We trust that you will bring your peace and your comfort and your love to their side. And so we pray for the Pack family. God, that you would bring them that peace. We pray for the Cox family that in the midst of tragedy, you, oh God, would bring them peace. We pray for the Grindstaff family. God, we're never prepared to see someone gone but I know that you have your hand on each one of these families and I know that you will hold them during this time. God, we pray for Robbie and Donna and Roberta and her family this morning. God, in these challenges, these health challenges, God, that you, you saw coming, you knew every need would be represented here today and, and Lord, you want to heal, restore, renew, 
So God, we lift them up to you this morning that you would be real in that home and in their lives. We lift up Kaylee to you this morning that you'd continue to touch her and heal her. And Lord, we lift up Evan to you this morning. That you would do what you do best. You're the great physician, God. And I have no doubt in my mind that at this very moment, you're working good things in Evan's life. And so, Lord, thank you for the strength and the courage that you've given him to walk through this time. And if it's your will this morning, God, you could heal him. And we believe not that you can, but that you will. Remove every cell, everything that's causing him an issue, God, in his young life. And bring him to renewal, restoration, and healing. So you'll get all the praise and you'll get all the glory. God, we pray over our time that we get to spend here together this morning that we're going to look at your word. You've sent me here this morning just to be a mouthpiece for what you want to say to your people. I pray, God, that you wouldn't let me say one thing that you don't want said here this morning. And that you would open the ears of these that are watching on the internet and these that are in the room and that you would do something in our hearts and in our minds that's supernatural this morning. And we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor for all these things. And we pray them in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you for being seated. Who's glad to be in the house of God this morning? Amen. There's something real and something powerful about being in His presence and being with a group of people who believe in Him and who, who are in His presence with you. And I want to thank you for being here. And I want to thank you who are watching online for being there, for for tuning in, for hitting the button and streaming because what I know is that God has something extremely important that He wants to tell us today. It's probably not going to go where we thought it was going to go. We're starting a new series. It's 1st of August and it's called Wrecked. And on the heels of July's message series, which was on Revelation, it looks like we would completely change gears. It looks like it would be a completely different thing. And what we're going to be discussing and talking about and diving into as the weeks of August go on and on are, are biblical examples, people in the Bible, and personal testimonies and examples of lives that have been wrecked. Anybody have a wrecked life? Or has had a wrecked life. If you haven't, you might want to buckle up. It may be coming. Talk about people like Moses and, and, and Jonah and Noah and David and Mary, the mother of Jesus, Joseph. Lives that I guarantee you, when they sat down and scratched out what they thought their life was going to be like, it turned out nothing like that. And we're going to be looking at those and we're going to be seeing how God takes the wreckage of our lives and makes something good. Amen? Well, we could stop right there. That's a message in itself. God takes what's wrecked and He makes something good. And a lot of us in this room, if not all of us, would be personally able to testify to the fact that there was wreckage and God did something great with it. And so we're going to be looking at those, those people. But in the, in the midst of that, before we can get there, before we identify with the Josephs, the Marys, the, the Davids, before we can identify with what happened to them, we need to look inward as we start this 
series, if you will, this series of messages, this idea of being wrecked. We, we need to look at ourselves this morning. And, and I want you to hear me. This is not what I wanted to preach. I, I had in mind all week what I wanted today to look like. And boy, I was going to bring you something that was going to just impact your life in a positive way. And we were all going to leave here smiling. And God wrecked that <laughs> yesterday. If you've been in ministry and there's several pastors in the room, you know what I'm talking about. You, you got something and you're just like, oh, I can't wait to get there and tell them that. So instead of having typed out sheets of paper and, and everything in order and me being able to come up here this morning and articulate to you this divine message, he changed it. And I have a message for all of us this morning that I'm going to tell you in just a minute. But before we get there, I want you to see a passage of Scripture. And it's in 1 John. I believe they're going to try to put that on the screen. Chapter 3, verses 3 and 9. Do you have your Bibles this morning? Who's got their Bible with them? Praise God. Take that thing everywhere you go. Mine's always in my truck, so I can pull it out. 1 John, chapter 3. Verses 3 through 9. Just listen if you don't have it in front of you. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him and does not sin, whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, he continues in verse 7, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. And for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. I'm going to read that again. That is so vitally important to the Christian faith. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. That means he, he, was, he came, he, he was brought to earth, that he might do what? Destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. I don't know if you've ever studied this passage before. I don't know if you've ever looked at it in depth. But when I read the words that say, people of God don't sin, it starts a, ch a chain process in my head of, how exactly that can be and, and what exactly he's writing. And, and, and then I start to look inward at, at the things that I'm doing in my life. You see, my sin breaks God's law. That's why it says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. Lawlessness are all of the things that break the very law of God. The very order that God has put in place. When I sin, I commit lawlessness. I break God's law. That's why he sent Jesus here, manifested Jesus to us to destroy, to break the power of sin. Because he knew that if we sinned, we're committing lawlessness. And the end result of lawlessness is death. And that that's where we would be heading. And so my sin, the things I've done, the things that I am doing, the things that I will do that are contrary to God's word, my sin breaks that law. And when I decide to continue in my sin, when I decide to continue in my sin, I, I'm taking part in the kingdom of darkness that's controlling this earth. Satan is the ruler of the principalities of the kingdom of this earth. That's why as we 
journeyed through Revelation into the month of July, you may have flipped between the pages of chapters 2 and 3 where they were, letters were written to the churches, to the throne room scene in chapter 4 and 5, and then the seals and the trumpets and the bowls that are explained to us there. And you may have seen reference to the kingdom of darkness and to Babylon. That is what we are living in. Babylon is the kingdom of this earth, the, 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 the Satan controls. And when I decide to continue in my sin, whatever that is, the thing that breaks God's law, I'm helping the kingdom of darkness. I'm contributing. In my mind, I'm agreeing with the kingdom of darkness because I've made the decision to sin. It breaks my heart as a pastor and as a Christian when I hear a brother or a sister tell me, I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. Because they don't realize what John is telling us here. They don't realize that they are helping the enemy. They're contributing to the darkness. They're saying, I agree with the darkness. Now, if I had just come in here this morning and asked all of us, do you agree with the darkness, the, the kingdom that Satan is in control of? You'd say, well, no, I don't agree with that. Well, of course we would say that. But by our very actions, by the things that we do, we're taking part in the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of this world. And that is the kingdom, as we understand, as we get to the end of the book of Revelation that is going away, that is going to be done away with by Jesus Christ himself when he comes and sets his foot on the Mount of Olives. Amen. Amen. We don't want to take part in the kingdom that is passing away. If we do that, if we say we want to voluntarily take part in the kingdom that is passing away, what we're saying is we just want to waste our time. Why would I want to put effort and time into contributing to a kingdom that's passing away? If, the, if, the, if a king from another country came into the United States or Gaston County or something like that, I'm just being facetious, and was going to take over, and you saw that his takeover was imminent, and there's no way that he could lose, and you had to pick sides, are you going to side with the kingdom that's going out, or are you going to side with the kingdom that's coming in? You're going to side with the kingdom that's coming in because you still want to have a seat at the table when it's all said and done and the dust settles. I'm telling you this morning, when you contribute, when you sin, when I decide to sin and I contribute, I'm contributing to a kingdom that's on its way out. It will not stand. It will not be here. As we read through our Bibles, we understand that it is fading away. Jesus came. That's what manifested means. That's what John was saying to us when he wrote that. God sent Jesus. He manifested him where? On earth. As a man with God-like qualities. To, to do what? To destroy the work of the devil. This thought permeated my mind all day yesterday. Why did God choose to send Jesus here? To destroy the work of the devil. It's plain, it's simple, it's right in front of us. We don't have to guess, we don't have to do a big theological search on what it means. He sent Jesus to destroy the works of the devil. Why? Because the works of the devil are lawlessness. Why? Because we, he knew that when we sin, we contributed to lawlessness and it would send us to hell with him. So he sent Jesus here. Aren't you glad that he did? I don't want to contribute. Yeah, give him praise if you're going to give him praise. I don't want to contribute to that kingdom. I don't want to invest in that kingdom. Because we know that that work that Jesus came to destroy, the work of the devil, is the work of stealing, killing, and destroying. I don't want you to separate those three words this morning. I want you to group them together. It doesn't say to steal, kill, or destroy. It says to steal, kill, 
and destroy. You see, the devil isn't happy with steal. And for a lot of us, he's already accomplished that mission. Stole everything you got. Put a ruin to it. He's not happy with kill. He's already done that. He wants to destroy. And that's the the enemy that we fight on a daily basis. That's why God encourages us to do what? Put on the armor of God to shield ourselves, to to build ourselves up in in the faith family with our connect groups and, and through church services and being in our word. He says, build yourself up so that you can fight against the enemy of your soul that's 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, doing what? Attempting to steal, kill, and destroy you and me. How does he do it? Through sin. Through lawlessness. So Jesus comes to manifest himself to destroy the work of the devil. And notice all those things go together. And so, Jesus came here to earth. He lived. He died. He rose again to destroy my sin. I want you to grab that this morning for yourself. I I want that to become a personal thing. I'm not talking about me. I don't want you to go home and say, well, that was nice. I'm glad he did that for you. I want you to internalize that. He sent Jesus to earth to destroy your sin so that you could be free of it. We talk about freedom in Christ. That's the freedom that we have in Christ, not to sin. We don't have to be in bondage to it. We don't have to let it control us. We don't have to contribute to the kingdom that's passing away. That's the freedom that he came to give us that we hold on to today. So what is sin? I feel like the church in general has sometimes done a bad job describing what it is. We know not to do it, but we don't know what we're not supposed to do. Did anybody have parents like I did that at some point in your childhood there were some things that you got punished for and you don't even know what you did? You just got the smack down for it or you got punished, you got put in time out. I want to make it very clear, very plain to us. God, help me make this plain to all of us today. What is sin? Sin is anything that violates God's law. Plain and simple. Now, the only reason that would be fuzzy to any of us is we don't know what God's law says. How can we know what God's law says? It's in here. Now, for the Old Testament scholars in the room, we know that there was about 603 laws And we know that he gave the children of Israel all through the Old Testament the opportunity to keep those laws. And were they able to do it? No. And God said, I need to send a plan so that you can keep the law. And so the law is complex. There's a lot in there. If you go through and dig out each one of them, none of us in this room are watching. None of us who have ever been born would be capable of keeping that law. We can't. But yet anything I do that violates God's law is sin. And if I sin, I'm contributing to the kingdom of darkness. I don't want to do that. When Jesus came, he summed it up for us so that we would have clarification. Are you ready? Here's the clarification. You will find this in Luke chapter 10. You will find it in Matthew chapter uh, uh, 22. Uh, You will find it in Mark chapter 12. And it simply says this. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Do I need to do the research? Do I need to go back to the Old Testament and write all 603 down? Do I need to keep a list? Do I need to have some accountability partners that will check me off each day for each little thing? No. 
what I need to do is I need to look at this verse and I need to say, am I loving the Lord my God with all of my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength? You see, there's four components to that, and we may have left one or two out along the way. And am I loving my neighbor as myself? Wouldn't that solve just about any problem, any situation, any complex issue in our society? Wouldn't that solve it if we could all accomplish that? Well, I'll just think about the, the tension on the streets of the world these days. If we loved the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, and we loved our neighbor as ourselves, would we have those issues? Probably not. So that's just one example, but we could apply it to anything that's going on and say, if I could achieve this simple command, if I could keep God's law in this way, it's very, very possible that I wouldn't sin. You say, well, how would that apply to the sin that's going on in my life? Well, see, when we sin, we're selfish. When we sin against somebody else, we're selfish. When we do them wrong. And so we could apply that in so many different ways and say, if I could get this right, if this could become my goal, that I wouldn't commit sin and, and, and contribute to the, to the kingdom of, of darkness. I want to love him with all of my heart. I want to love him with all of my mind. I want to love him with all of my soul. And, and I don't even know if I know how to do that. And I want to love him with all of my strength. And when I see my brother, my sister, I want to love them like I love myself. So... On the heels of all of the Revelation study and the thinking about the end times, and I know some of our connect groups are going through a study on Revelation and diving in. They want to get to the meat of the matter, and I know there's conversations going on in some of the connect groups about the Holy Spirit and the role that He plays in our lives and, and how we can grow in the Word and all of these things that we're going through as we process. Are we in the end times? Could this be it? The culmination of history that we read about throughout the Bible and in the, in the book of Revelation. Are we there? And then we start to ask questions like, when will this happen? What else needs to happen? What events will take place as we process all of that and we, we go through all of those things? We're looking for signs. We're looking for wonders. We're looking for uh, something that would clue us in. That this is it. Or that it's not it, and that we have more time. As we do all of that, what I fear the most is that we've forgotten kind of the fundamental principles of our faith and of our convictions. And we're too interested in theology and getting to the bottom of the details. And we've forgotten that we're allowing sin in our lives. We've covered it up with church attendance and we've covered it up with, with uh, ha having the right friends and we've covered it up with a couple of things that we've got fixed in our life, mostly on our own accord probably. But there are certain areas of our life where we have closed the door and put a lock on it and we are unwilling to do away with it. I came this morning to warn all of us Revelation is a book of warning. It gives the details, and it's great read, and, and, and there's a lot in there I don't understand. As a matter of fact, I, I could attribute that to a lot of these books in this, in this book. I, I don't understand everything I read in here, and, and it's a good read, and, and I love it, and I keep diving in, and every time I open this up and I look a little bit deeper, I find a little bit more depth. How about you? But what I don't want to do is I don't want to get so caught up in the weeds that I have not taken the opportunity and the time to look inward and to make sure that there's nothing else in my life that needs to be dealt with because it's not going to do me any good on the day of judgment for me to know the six seals or the six bowls or any of that stuff in detail. That's not what he's going to ask me. He's going to ask me this question and he's going to ask you too. So if you don't know what the question is, please pay attention. What did you do with Jesus? What did you do? 
You heard, you knew, you were preached to, you sat in services your whole life. What did you do with my son? Because I sent him, I manifested him to you to destroy sin so that you could have freedom over it. What did you do with Jesus? So the thing that he sent me here today to tell us is this. Stop sinning. Time is short. Stop sinning. We all know what it is that we're doing if there's something that's not right, if there's something that is breaking God's commands, God's laws. We know. He's given us a conscience and He's given us the Holy Spirit if we are saved to prick our conscience and to remind us and to he calls us to heed one way or another. He's given us everything that we could possibly need. And now He's calling on us today and those of you who are watching and He's saying, stop sinning. God's not playing games anymore. He, he's not going to wait much longer before He tells Jesus, go get your bride the rapture of the church as we were sitting talking again this morning is imminent, meaning it's going to happen at any moment. We do not have time, brothers and sisters, to play games with God. Could I be any more clear this morning? Could I be any more poignant when I say, stop sinning? Time is short. He is coming for his bride. And the Bible tells us he's coming for a bride that was looking for him and a bride that has no spot and no wrinkle. It gives us that visual appearance of what a bride would look like. You don't go to your wedding day, ladies, with wrinkles in your dress and you got coffee from where you uh, spilled it on there. No, you go with a, a, a dress, a gown, whatever it is, and you look in your best. You had your makeup done and your hair is great and grooms. We didn't show up at our weddings in, in, in our t-shirts and our flip-flops. We put on the dog, as we used to say, and, and we dressed to the nines, and uh, we, we are ready. That's the person that Jesus is coming back for. That's the person that will disappear in the twinkling of an eye at the rapture, is the person who was without spot and without wrinkle and was looking for the bride to return. Can I get an amen from anybody? And y'all got to help me this morning. He's not looking for lackadaisical people that were just skirting by thinking we had plenty of time and it was going to be okay and he's going to overlook the sin in my life. Surely I'm not as bad as that guy. It doesn't say that anywhere in my text. Nothing in my Bible says if you're better than that guy. The only joke I know about that is if you and I are in the woods and there's a bear chasing us, I don't have to outrun the bear, I only got to outrun you. Right? Right? Nothing. There's no comparison in God's word. He said, I'm coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. And I'm coming back for a bride that's looking for me. So if I'm looking for him to return, if I believe that with all that is in me, if I feel that fire in my bones, then why would I continually, habitually, and purposely sin and allow that to be in my life? Here's the other thing that he's telling us this morning and this is not comfortable for any of us but I believe as I was mopping this floor yesterday in this church God spoke to me by the way if you don't volunteer to do something around here you're missing a great opportunity to hear from God he speaks to me almost every time I mop this floor and he said to me you tell them as one of their pastors that deeply loves them, wakes up in the middle of the night in tears over the things that are going on in their life, you tell them to stop sinning. And if they don't, I will expose them. Now, do you really think I wanted to stand up here and tell you that this morning? I don't want to hear that. But I need you to hear me this morning. God said, if you don't stop sinning, if you won't cut it out, I will expose you. 
Now, he's not going to do it because he's mean and because he's that thunderbolt God in heaven waiting on us to mess up so he can zap us. He is going to do it because he loves you with an everlasting love. He will not allow you to go into eternity and suffer in eternal damnation. He wants you to be with him. He is going to expose you. The sin that is breaking my law, he said, and destroying you will be exposed. I love you too much to let it continue, so I will expose it and bring it into the light for all to see, not to embarrass you, but so that you can turn from it, repent, and come back to me. Now, those words are written in a pencil that I had in my hand, but they came from him. Folks, we have played around with God too long. I don't know what church looks like from now on. Maybe this is it. But I'd rather be in a small group of people who are desperate to have their life straight with God. A, a desperate people who want to see God move in a powerful way. I'd rather be in a small group of people like that than a big room of people who are indifferent and don't care. I want to see God move in families. I'm tired of hearing about marriages that are on the rocks and about to be uh, split up Christian people, people who ought to know better. I I'm tired of hearing people that are struggling with addictions and in the depths of sin and can't find their way out. I'm tired of all of that stuff. And in some cases, not all, I'm not trying to generalize it, but in some cases it's because they haven't gotten serious with who God is. They haven't dealt with the sin that's in their life. And they're allowing it to continue there. God will not have it. He cannot be in the presence of sin. If you're choosing sin over God today, you can have it. But God is warning you this morning. If you don't deal with it, He's going to expose it. The very people that you have covered it for so long... It's going to come to light. In Luke chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. Say these words, listen carefully, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have spoken in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. Folks, there's nothing that you've ever done that you think is concealed. We can't conceal anything from an omnipotent, omnipresent, all-knowing God. We can try. And we can succeed sometimes for a long time. But God is not a God of concealment. And all the things that we've said in the darkness, all the things that we've whispered to someone's inner ear... That we thought no one will ever know. God's word says, not only do I know them, but those very things will be shouted from the housetops. I don't want that. I, I, I don't want that. So what's the path here? Where are we going to go now? What are we going to do? Now that you've come here this morning and told me God's getting ready to wreck my life. He is. If you don't deal with the sin that you know is there, that's contrary to His Word, the sin that is also lawlessness, 1 John said, the sin that will send you to hell, if you don't do that, God's going to wreck you. You don't believe He's all-powerful and can do it? I wouldn't try him. I wouldn't try him. That's the message. Before we go look at Jonah, before we go look at how God wrecked David's life, before we go look at how a, 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 a lady by the name of Mary did not want to spend her days on the streets of her town 
pregnant out of wedlock. Her life was wrecked before we can relate to any of them and say, well, at least that's not me. And let's, he said, you got to look inward. You better deal with the sin in your life. Or I'll wreck you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? I wanted to talk about the shipwreck of Paul this morning. In Acts chapters 27 and 28, that's what I wanted to talk about. Paul suffered four shipwrecks in his life. Literal shipwrecks. On top of the personal and emotional shipwrecks that he went through. But God wouldn't allow that this morning because He loves you so much, so desperately, that not only did He manifest His Son, send His Son, His one and only Son, as we're reminded in John 3.16, to come, to die, to be resurrected, to pay the price of your sin, on the cross. See, we make the Bible and Christianity and religion, if you will, we, we make it too complex sometimes. It's not complex this morning. There's a time for complex. There's a time for theology. This morning, God said, would you just go make it simple to them one more time? Because as we found out with three precious families this week, time is short. We can't count on tomorrow. We don't know how many breaths we have left. We don't know how many trips on vacation we've got left. We don't know our time. We don't know how long it'll be before the eastern sky splits. The trumpet of God sounds and he calls his church home I don't know why he calls me up here to beg people to do what's right but that's just the burden that he's put on me that's just the calling that he has on my life is to it's to give you another opportunity. I don't know who you are. You, you might be watching on, online. You might not even be in this room. Or you may be right here. And the Holy Spirit, who you don't even have a relationship with, so you're not even sure what you're feeling right now. But I'm, I'm trying to tell you what it is. It's the Holy Spirit that is, is pricking you now, is working in your heart and in your mind. And you know you're harboring sin in your life. You've struggled with it. God knows that. And He's not here today to ask you to figure it all out and to have all the answers. He's asking you to take one step. It's a one-step process this morning. It's a one-step program. Is anybody listening? It's not complex. He, he didn't say you got to get your life in order. As a matter of fact, we've got Bible story after Bible story. I should call them accounts because they're not stories, they're truth. There, there's an account in the Bible that says, don't go get your stuff in order, just come on. That's what he's saying to us this morning is that this is not complex. I don't want this to be complex. He's just saying, take this one step and ask me. To forgive your sin. Isn't that just as plain and simple as it can possibly be? He'll do the rest. We don't have to do anything today, right now, other than just ask Him to forgive you of your sin. I don't want you, my brother, my sister, to suffer. God exposing you. I, I don't want 
what you've done and what you're doing to come to light and there to be a big traumatic experience in your life. I want your testimony, your story to be similar to thousands and millions of others who re realized at some point in their life, I need to go ask God for forgiveness of this and then I need to turn from it. I need to get the help I need. I need to get into a discipleship relationship with somebody. I need to connect with fellow believers and I need accountability in my life through relationship, which is exactly the plan God put you here for. So I'm simply asking you, today before we pray and end our time together is there anybody in this room that would like for me to remember them in prayer just throw up a hand and say remember me I want to ask for forgiveness of sin in my life anybody amen anybody else amen amen truth be known all of our hands should be in the air because we've all sinned and done what? Come short of the glory of God. The Bible says in 1 John that if we say we have no sin or have not sinned, we lie. Would you take one more step and if you raised your hand, or even if you didn't, but you know you need to be here, I want to open up this altar. Come, come now. I want to pray with you. I want somebody to be able to pray with you. I want this power of sin in your life that is keeping you from the things that God wants for you. I want it broken today, right now. No more delays. Thank you, brother. Right down here. Somebody's going to come just be right behind you and, and pray with you. Guys, I need some prayer warriors right here. God's not playing with us anymore. Oh, God, this is an eternal moment. This is what you came for. This is what you sent your son for, God. This is what you manifested him for, is to break the power of sin. Holy Spirit, I pray for a conviction power to fall on this place. We have held on, ran from, concealed too long. Who else needs to be here? Time is short. Pastor, would you come help us? Be praying where you're at. Stretch a hand in this direction and believe that the Holy Spirit is doing work in these individuals, breaking the power of sin that, that they struggle with and that they will be free from it.
Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us so much. So intently. So recklessly. That you would care so much about these men right here. And all of us, that you would allow us to hear your word again today. That you would warn us as a good, good father. You would send us warning from your word and say, stop sinning. Deal with it now. Time is short. God, we celebrate you today. We stand in awe of who you are because you can take a life and situations that are wrecked and you can make them new. You can make them glorious. You can make them shine. You can make them testimonies to the rest of the world of who you are, God. And so in this moment, Lord, I know there's some people that needed to respond. I know there is. God, you continue to work on them. We'll continue to love them for who they are. Lord, if it comes, and I, I hesitate to even pray this, but if it comes to you having to expose them to save their soul, God, do it. Do it. Because I would rather hold them while they weep and agonize over that than not see them walk in freedom and in righteousness. So God, we thank you for your word today. Your word still strands, stands tall. We wave the banner of Jesus Christ in this dark and dismal world. We hang on to the hope of Jesus Christ our Lord. We will not be silent. We will not be restrained. We will worship you. We will praise you. We will stand on your word. Regardless of what the government tells us or the people in the streets say, we will, we will stand in awe of who you are and glorify you. You are our God. Our strength. Our courage. In you will we trust. In you will we trust. In Jesus' name. Will you stand and worship Him before we leave this place today? Thank you for tuning into this week's message. For more information about Connections Church, you can go to connectionschurch.church or follow us on Facebook and Instagram.